Well, once again, welcome to Anchor Bible School. We're glad you're here. Has it been an exciting experience so far? Yes. Praise the Lord. You're not too tired, right? No. Amen. Well, praise the Lord. You must have gotten a good night's sleep last night. <laughs> I know I did. Uh, but uh, I'm glad to have you here, and we have some exciting things to study in this particular session. I want us to go in our syllabus to the bottom of page 16. The bottom of page 16 of our syllabus. And I'm going to read this statement from Ellen White. We're dealing with the principle that Christ is the center of the Old Testament. He's the hero of the Old Testament. Every text in the Old Testament points to Jesus Christ. Uh, Ellen White caught this, uh, this important point in this statement from Desire of Ages, page 211 and 212. This is what she says. This is an, an audacious statement. In every page... How many pages? In every page, whether history or precept or prophecy, the Old Testament scriptures are irradiated with the glory of the Son of God. So what is the glory of the Old Testament? Jesus. So far as it was of, div of divine institution, the entire system of Judaism was a compacted prophecy of the gospel. What does compacted mean? Scale model, folks. A compacted prophecy, see? And, and then Jesus gives it, gives it breadth when he fulfills it. She continues saying, To Christ give witness all the prophets. Give all the prophets witness. From the promise given to Adam, down through the patriarchal line and the legal economy, heaven's glorious light made plain the footsteps of the Redeemer. Seers beheld the star of Bethlehem, the Shiloh to come, as future things swept before them in mysterious procession. In every sacrifice, Christ's death was shown. In every cloud of incense, His righteousness ascended. By every jubilee trumpet, His name was sounded. In the awful mystery of the Holy of Holies, His glory dwelt. Quite a statement, isn't it? Uh, and you read the book Desire of Ages, it becomes very clear that Ellen White not only had this in a theoretical sense, but the Desire of Ages shows Jesus in all of His glory in the Old Testament, as well as the books Patriarchs and Prophets and Prophets and Kings. Now, St. Augustine, um, you know, I don't like to quote uh, saints that much, especially when they're human saints, so-called. But he said something that I think that is very wise. He said, the new is in the old concealed, and the old is in the new revealed. Uh, that, that's a, a nice way to put it in a nutshell. Now going to page 17, the Old Testament is not abolished, but rather fulfilled. Is there a difference between abolishing and fulfilling? Yes. yes. Notice, let's change the word around from fulfill to fill full. What does Jesus do with the Old Testament? He fills it full of meaning. To fulfill means to fill full. Jesus fills the Old Testament with meaning. If Jesus had not come, the Old Testament would be an incomprehensible riddle. Jesus gives meaning to the Old Testament. If Christ had not come, the Old Testament would have no explanation or reason. What would be the reason for killing millions of animals? The Old Testament in itself has no light. Its light is reflected light. The Old Testament is a collection of stories, laws, precepts, biographies, and events. If the Old Testament were alone, it would be an enigma. The Old Testament is like a light bulb. Christ must give the bulb electric current in order for the Old Testament to give light. Now, uh, the Jews and Christians commit the same basic mistake. 
The Christians of today, they say, well, we're New Testament Christians. And the Jews say, we're Old Testament, not Christians, but we go by the Old Testament. Now actually, when you look at it carefully, both of them are committing the same error. Because Christians don't see Christ in the Old Testament, and the Jews don't see Christ in the New. Let's read this statement. Christ's Object Lessons 128 and 129. There are those who profess to believe and to teach the truths of the Old Testament while they reject the New. Who would those be? The Jews. But in refusing to receive the teachings of Christ, they show that they do not believe that which the patriarchs and prophets have spoken. Had ye believed Moses, Christ said, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. Hence, there is no real power in their teaching of even the Old Testament. Many who claim to believe and to teach the gospel are in a similar error. Who would those be? New Testament Christians, so called. They set aside the Old Testament scriptures, of which Christ declared, They are they which testify of me. In rejecting the old, they virtually reject the new. For both are parts of an inseparable whole. No man can rightly present the law of God without the gospel, or the gospel without the law. The law is the gospel embodied, and the gospel is the law unfolded. The law is the root, the gospel is the fragrant blossom and fruit which it bears. The Old Testament sheds light upon the new, and the new upon the old. Each is a revelation of the glory of God in Christ. Both present truths that will continually reveal new depths of the meaning of the earnest, to the earnest seeker. And so these, that, that's a very significant statement. You know, people who say, I'm a New Testament Christian, you can't understand the New Testament without the Old. And those who say, oh, I go by the Old Testament, you know, I'm not a Christian, well, they can never really understand the Old. Because the center of the Old is Christ, and the center of the New is Christ. So you can't accept one and not accept the other without seeing Christ. And so Christ is at the very center of Scripture. Now, I have a list of prophecies here from the Old Testament about Christ. I'm going to go through these very quickly. I'm not going to mention the references. Um, you know, for those who are watching the streaming, we've received several requests uh, to have the materials that uh, we're making available. And, uh, you know, uh, if you beg hard enough, uh, <laughs> we might accommodate you. Uh, but I, I'm not going to take the time to mention the specific verses. I'm just going to mention the events because you have the verses in the syllabus. The Old Testament says that Jesus would be born in Bethlehem. He would be born of a virgin. He would be announced by a star. Children would be massacred when he would, was born. He would be called out of Egypt. He would be baptized or anointed when the 69th week of Daniel 9 ended. He would perform marvelous works and be a powerful preacher. The Jews would reject his message. The Jews would serve him only with their lips. He would enter Jerusalem on a donkey in the midst of great acclamation. He would cast out the money changers from the temple. Zeal for God's house would consume him. He would be sold for 30 pieces of silver. His disciples would all forsake him. He would die a vicarious death. He would say on the cross, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That comes directly from Psalm 22 and verse 1, the very words that Jesus spoke on the cross. His hands and his feet would be pierced. Lots would be cast upon his garments. His heart would be poured out like water. His enemies would spit in his face. His enemies would dare him to come down from the cross. None of his bones would be broken. On the cross he would say, I thirst. His passion would last three days and three nights. His burial would be with the rich. He would resurrect from the dead on the third day. He would ascend to heaven, and he would sit at the Father's right hand. Do you think there was sufficient evidence that Jesus was the Messiah? Amen. Of course there was. But reading the Old Testament without Christ will lead you to wrong conclusions. And that's the problem. With, with the Jewish nation today, those who have not accepted Jesus as the Messiah. They have a veil over 
their mind. And the veil is taken away when they see Jesus in the Old Testament, when they see that their Messiah is Jesus Christ. You know, we say Jesus Christ it belongs to the church. No, uh, the Messiah belongs to the Jews first. It's their Messiah. And when, when, they, when they see Jesus in the Old Testament, the Old Testament suddenly it becomes a light bulb that where you turn on the switch. You say, wow, we've missed we, we've missed our Messiah totally and completely. And uh, Ellen White states that in the end time uh, there will be thousands upon thousands of Jews that will accept the message of the remnant and come over to the Lord's side. And so, and so we, we, we love the Jews. We love them because, you know, uh, through this nation God brought the oracles of God to us. God loves them. And we need to pray for them that they will see the light, that they will see the reason for their own religion. <laughs> they don't have a reason for their religion. What, what was the purpose of all of the sacrifices? What was the purpose of all of the incense? What is the meaning of the Hebrew feasts? What does the sanctuary teach? Totally in the dark. Until you see that Jesus fulfills everything, say, wow, look what I've been missing. Now, what I want us to do is go to the material, the Lord is our rock. The Lord is our rock. I'm going to illustrate now the steps that we need to follow in finding Christ in a particular passage from the Old Testament, or a particular symbol in the Old Testament. And we're going to go through this material, uh, the Lord is our rock, and we're going to see several principles involved here. We're going to see the principle of sola scriptura. We're going to see Christ at the center. Uh, we're, we're going to see the importance of the study of structure. We're going to look at several principles here, and I'll bring them out as we go along. Now, there is an intimate connection between what D Jesus did on the cross and the fire that fell on the day of Pentecost. You cannot understand the fire unless you understand the cross. So the first thing that I want us to notice is that there's a very close link between the cross and the fire that descended on the, on the day of Pentecost. The second point that I want to underline is that the important thing that took place on the day of Pentecost was not what happened on earth. The important event took place in heaven. And what took place on earth was simply the announcement of what was taking place in heaven. In fact, you know that every time that Jesus begins a new work in the sanctuary, there's an earthly announcement? Let me ask you, when Jesus, when Jesus came to the, to the camp, to camp with us, was it announced? Remember the angels singing, glory to God in the highest? Remember the wise men who came? They announced that the Messiah had been born. There was an earthly announcement. When Jesus was about to go to the cross, was there an announcement? Remember the triumphal entry? A little less than a week before Jesus died on the cross, the purpose was to attract the attention of everybody. Are you, are you following me or not? Yeah. Yet when Jesus, when Jesus was going to begin His work in the holy place of the sanctuary, was there an earthly announcement? Oh, of course there was. There was a mighty rushing wind and there were tongues of fire, and the place shook. <laughs> there, was a, there were tremendous phenomena that took place on earth, but that was an announcement of something that Jesus had begun to do in heaven. And let me ask you, leading up to 1844, was there an earthly announcement? Oh, yes there was, the Millerite movement was announcing that Jesus was about to enter a new phase of His ministry in the heavenly sanctuary, in the most holy place. See, there's always an announcement when Jesus is going to move into a new phase of His work. Amen. Is there going to be an announcement when the judgment of the living is about to begin? The loud cry will be the announcement that the judgment of the living is either beginning or about to begin because the Sabbath issue will be the issue that will determine who is on one side and who is on the other. So there will be this powerful, loud cry announcement on earth announcing that the judgment of the living is either beginning or is about to begin. There's no date attached. But we can know 
when thousands of people are leaving their churches and joining the remnant church, we know that the final movements are going to be very, very rapid ones. So two things. Number one, there's a connection between the cross and the fire. And number two, the important event was not on earth, the important event was in heaven. The earthly event was simply an announcement of something that was happening in heaven. Now let's go to uh, the next section in our material, and I want to show you the connection between the sacrifice and the fire. There's this pattern in the Old Testament where you have a sacrifice and then God consumes the sacrifice with fire. There's this pattern that I want us to notice. The first example is Abel's sacrifice. Now the Bible doesn't mention specifically uh, that God sent fire to consume Abel's sacrifice, but it stands to reason when we look at all of the other examples in the Old Testament, that's the way that God showed that he accepted a sacrifice. So I'm going to read this statement from Ellen White, Signs of the Times, February 6, 1879, where Ellen White explains that God had respect unto this sacrifice, that is unto Abel's sacrifice, and fire came down from heaven and consumed it. How did God show that he accepted Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's sacrifice? Because he consumed the sacrifice that was offered by Abel. Sacrifice, fire. The next example that I want to give is when the wilderness tabernacle was inaugurated in the desert. Let's read Leviticus 9 verses 22 to 24. Then Aaron lifted his hand toward the people, blessed them, and came down from offering this. Notice three offerings. The sin offering, the burnt offering, and peace offerings. And Moses and Aaron went into the tabernacle of meeting and came out and blessed the people. Then the glory of the Lord appeared to all the people. And now notice, how did God show that he accepted these three sacrifices that were placed upon the altar? Verse 24. And fire came out from before the Lord and consumed the burnt offering and the fat on the altar. When all the people saw it, they shouted and fell on their faces. So how did God show that he accepted these sacrifices upon the altar? By consuming them with fire. Sacrifice, fire. The next example I want to give is from the period of the Hebrew monarchy, the period of the Hebrew kings. First Chronicles 21, 26. You remember that the Ark of the Covenant was placed on Ornan's threshing floor for a while before it was taken to Jerusalem, after it was recovered from the Philistines. And I want you to notice that David offered a sacrifice and then something happened. Let's read it, 1 Chronicles chapter 21 and verse 26. And David built there an altar to the Lord and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings and called on the Lord. And he answered him from heaven by fire on the altar of burnt offering. Once again, sacrifice and then what? Fire, showing that God accepted the sacrifice. The next example I want to give is when uh, the temple built by Solomon was dedicated. Notice I did not say Solomon's temple because it wasn't Solomon's temple. Neither was, neither was the ark Noah's ark. Nor was Jacob's ladder Jacob's. It's the Lord's ladder, it's the Lord's ark, and it's the Lord's temple. So when the temple built by Solomon was dedicated, I want you to notice what happened according to 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 1. When Solomon had finished praying, fire came down from heaven and consumed the burnt offering and the sacrifices, and the glory of the Lord filled the temple. Once again, sacrifice and then what? fire. So there's this pattern, sacrifice, fire, sacrifice, fire. Let's go to one further example. 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 38. 1 Kings chapter uh, 18 and verse 38. This uh, is the experience of Elijah on Mount Carmel. Uh, you remember that he put the sacrifices, the animals upon the altar, and I want you to notice how God responded to his plea. And of course we all know this story, it says, Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, and it licked up the water that was in the trench. Now when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God, the Lord, He is God. So you have this pattern of sacrifice and then fire showing that God accepted the sacrifice. 
Now what I want us to do is to look at a different symbolism that teaches the same lesson. You see, uh, there's the idea that the sacrifice is accepted by the Lord because of the fire. But now let's look at another symbol that teaches the same lesson. I'm referring to the rock from which water came in the Old Testament. So let's go in our Bibles to Exodus chapter 17 and verses 1 through 6. Exodus 17 and verses 1 through 6. There are two rock episodes in the Old Testament, and each of them teaches a very important lesson. Exodus 17, 1 through 6. You're going to see in a minute how this symbolism relates to the symbolism of sacrifice and fire. It's the same lesson but with different symbols. Exodus 17 verse 1 says, Then all the congregation of the children of Israel set out on their journey from the wilderness of sin, according to the commandment of the Lord, and camped in Rephidim. But there was no water for the people to drink. Therefore the people contended with Moses, and said, Give us water that we may drink. So Moses said to them, Why do you contend with me? Why do you tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water. And the people complained against Moses and said, Why is it that you have brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? Let me ask you, is grumbling and mumbling sin? The Bible says whatever is not of faith is sin. In Romans 14 verse 23, whatever is not of faith is, of, is sin. Uh, was Israel showing great ungratefulness toward God? I mean, you read the previous chapter, God had rained bread from the bakery of heaven. Imagine what, uh, how busy the angels were making this bread <laughs> to feed a million men, not counting women and children. Every day, except one day of the week, for 40 years. Wow, that's amazing. They'd seen the Red Sea open. They'd seen the, the Egyptians swell. They'd seen the plagues falling upon Egypt. They'd seen all kinds of, of signs that God was with them and that God was blessing them. And now they're complaining because there's no water. They deserve to fall under the judgment of God. So in verse 4, we're told, So Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, What shall I do with this people? They are almost ready to stone me. And now God says something very interesting. And the Lord said to Moses, Go on before the people, and take with you some of the elders of Israel. Also take in your hand your rod, with which you struck the river, that is the river Nile, when it was turned into blood, with which you struck the river, and go. Verse 6, Behold, I will stand before you there on the rock in Horeb, and you shall strike the rock, and water will come out of it that the people may drink. Now, this is an interesting episode. You have three symbols in this story. You have a rock, you have a rod, and you have the water that comes from the rock. So how do you suppose we can find out what the rock means and what the rod means, and what the water represents. Hello, <laughs> sola scriptura. Because if you only read this passage, you have no interpretation to the symbols. So where do you find other passages that allude to this story that we find here? A Bible concordance. And where else? The marginal references, that's right. And, when, and so when we go to a concordance, we find all sorts of texts that help us understand what God wanted to teach through this particular passage. Now in this passage we have three symbols, and we need to study each symbol within itself and determine what that symbol means, and then after we've done that individually, we'll put them all together to get the picture. So what you do is you interpret the symbols individually, and then after you understand what each symbol means, then you bring them together so that you see how they relate to each other. Now the first symbol that we want to take a look at is the rock. What does the rock represent? Well, Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, nine times in this chapter, it tells us that the rock is the Lord. 
Should Israel have understood even that in the Old Testament that the rock was more than a literal rock? They could understand that in the Old Testament. Yes. Could they have understood that the manna was more than physical food? Yes. Because Moses told them in Deuteronomy 8, he says that God gave them manna from heaven that they might know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. They knew that the manna represented God's word. Moses told them so. And so they should have known that the rock was a symbol, even in the Old Testament. It says in Deuteronomy 32 verse 4, He is the rock. See, the rock is a person. His work is perfect. For all his ways are justice, a God of truth and without injustice, righteous and upright is he. And in this chapter 32, <laughs> you know, uh, Moses is bragging a little bit. He says, the rock of the, of the pagans are not like our rock. <laughs> because the pagans had their rock too. <laughs> but their, rock, their, their gods were made out of stone. Here the stone represents the Lord. Now, the rock then in the Old Testament represents the Lord. But which particular person are we dealing with here? Because we have God the Father, we have the Son, we have the Holy Spirit. Which individual here are we dealing with? 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verses 1 through 4 has the answer. 1 Corinthians 10, 1 through 4. Moreover, brethren, I do not want you to be unaware that all of our fathers were under the cloud, all passed through the sea, all were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea, all ate the same, what? spiritual food. Ah, it wasn't only physical food. The same spiritual food. And all drank the same spiritual drink. So the so water represents something beyond the literal water, beyond the literal H2O. For they drank from that spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. So who is the Lord who is mentioned in Deuteronomy 32? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the rock. Now, you know what's interesting in this story? In this story in Exodus 17? God, Jesus tells Moses, because Jesus is speaking, he says, you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to stand on the rock. So there you have the symbol and what the symbol represents together. The rock is the symbol and Jesus is standing on the rock. So you have the symbol and what the symbol represents in the story. And so now we have to interpret what the rod represents. Is it clear what the rock represents? Yes. Now we need to interpret what the rod represents. What does the rod represent? Well, the rod represents judgment. Every time that Moses raised his rod, what happened? A judgment fell upon the Egyptians. But not only does the rod represent judgment, but the act of smiting with the rock represents that judgment is falling upon. In other words, the act of the rod striking the rock or falling upon the rock means that a judgment is falling upon the rock. I can imagine that when Moses uh, was there before the people and they were complaining and murmuring, and now Moses raises his rod before the people, the people were probably shaking in their sandals. Woo, they knew what the power that was in that rod. That rod of judgment. But lo and behold, instead of the rod falling upon the people who were guilty, the rod fell upon the rock. Interesting. Now the, the word smite that is used here, you will smite the rock, is the Hebrew word naka. And basically this word is translated in different ways in the Old Testament. It's translated uh, to smite, to hit, to kill. There are many, many different synonymous terms that are used to describe this. So the act of smiting with the rod symbolizes the fact that the judgment is falling upon. Now let's read Isaiah 53 verse 4. This messianic prophecy, interesting messianic prophecy that uses the very same word smite but it applies it to the Messiah. Notice uh, Isaiah 53 and verse 4. It says there, Surely He has borne our griefs and our sorrows, yet we esteemed Him naka. We esteemed the Messiah what? St 
stricken. Same identical word that is used for striking the rock. It says, yet we esteemed him stricken. Smitten by whom? Smitten by God and afflicted. So the rod represents judgment. And the falling of the rod represents execution of judgment. It means punishing. Now what does the water represent? We've interpreted two symbols so far. The first symbol is the rock. Represents whom? Christ. And then you have the rod, which represents judgment. And the act of smiting represents the fact that the judgment is falling upon. Incidentally, uh, when Moses smote with the rod the river Nile, a plague fell, a judgment fell. The Nile was turned into blood. And when he smote the dust, lice came forth from the dust. So the act of smiting means that a judgment of God is falling upon. Now what does the water represent in this episode? Well, when the rock was smitten, it gave its what? It gave its water. Now what does the water represent? The water represents the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. You say, well, where do you get that from? Let's go to John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. John chapter 7, verses 37 to 39. You know, in this passage, uh, Jesus is at the Feast of Tabernacles. And it's the last day of the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the eighth day. It's called the great day of the feast. And Jesus is present in Jerusalem. And he's going to make a revolutionary statement. In verse 37, it says, On the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out, saying, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. So who is the rock? Jesus. He said, I'm the rock, come to me and drink. Like people came to the rock to drink. Jesus says, come to me and drink. And now comes something very important. He who believes in me, the word believes means to trust in Jesus. It means to claim Jesus as Savior. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Out of whose heart will flow rivers of living water? Not out of Jesus, no. Out of the person who believes. Are you with me or not? Jesus says, come to me and drink. And if you believe in me, trust in me, that's what it means to drink. If you trust in me, then I will give you the water, and the water will be in you, and you will become a fountain of water. That's what he's saying. What was Jesus referring to? Notice verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. So what does the water represent? The Spirit. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom, the, now listen carefully, whom those what? Believing in him, that is trusting in him, conf- repenting of sin, confessing their sins, claiming Jesus as their Savior, and trusting in him. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit, whom those believing in him would what? Would receive. For the Holy Spirit was not yet given, because Jesus was not yet glorified. When was Jesus glorified? actually beyond the resurrection when he was installed at the right hand of God when he was invested as high priest in heaven when he went before his father that's when Jesus was glorified are you following me or not now how are we to understand this I like to illustrate it with the relationship between the sun and the moon you know you go out on a clear night in Fresno And you look into the sky and you see this beautiful full moon. You say, oh, how beautiful the moon is tonight. Well, that's only partially true because the moon is ugly. (laughs) What makes the moon beautiful? The sunlight shines on it. And then do you know what the moon does? The sun shines on the moon and then the moon shines to the earth. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. But he also said, ye are the light of the world. Now how are we to understand that? Jesus is the sun and we are moons. And when Jesus shines on us, we shine to others. 
What Jesus is saying is that when we drink the water, we become fountains of water. Because the water fills us, then we are able to share what God has given to us, to others. The greatest sign that you know Jesus is that you cannot keep Jesus inside. You want other people to have the experience that you've had. If you don't feel that intense desire to tell people about Jesus, perhaps it's because you don't know Jesus. Because when you drink the water, you become a fountain of water. When you receive the light, you project the light, or you reflect the light to the earth. So Jesus is saying that on the day of Pentecost, the disciples would what? The disciples would drink the water because they believed and trusted in Jesus, and when they drank the water, they would become fountains of water. Let me ask you, what is the first thing that the, that the disciples did after they received the Holy Spirit? Preach! Preach! Preach about whom? About Jesus. You see, they drank the water, and because they drank the water, now what? Now, they shared the water that they had received. Now, there's a second episode concerning the rock in the Old Testament. But before that, let me just read 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13. Uh, where it clearly says that the water represents the Holy Spirit. It says, For by one Spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and all have been made to drink into one Spirit. So what does the water represent? The Holy Spirit. And when you receive the Holy Spirit, then you are what? Then you become a fountain to share what God has given you. Now there's a second episode, rock episode. It's found in Numbers 20, verses 7 through 11. You have it there in your material. Let's read that passage. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Take the rod, you and your brother Aaron gather the congregation together. But now there's a, there's a difference. God says what? Speak. Speak to the rock. In other words, say to the rock, give me your water. Speak to the rock before their eyes, and it will yield its water. So the first time God says, strike the rock, and the second time God says, speak to the rock, and ask the rock for its water. Why, why the difference? Well, you know what Moses did. He was pretty mad. And you know what? Moses spent 40 years with the children of Israel in the wilderness. A congregation of a million, not counting women and children. Senior pastor. <laughs> And in those 40 years, he never lost it till the very end. In fact, Ellen White says in Patriarchs and Prophets that if Moses had not committed that one sin, he would have been translated to heaven from among the living. He would not have died, she says in Patriarchs and Prophets. The impression is that during those 40 years, of course, he had 40 years of preparation in the wilderness. See? He had his Pentecost experience. And that's why he was so patient. But he lost it. And instead of speaking to the rock, what did he do? He took the rod and he struck the rock twice. And as a result, God said, you will not enter the promised land. That was, that was terrible for Moses. Imagine 40 years longing to, to reach the destiny that God had said they were going to have. And now God says, you're not going to enter. Wow. What was so serious about what Moses did? It was not simple disobedience. Notice Patriarchs and Prophets, page 418. By his rash act, Moses took away the force of the lesson that God purposed to teach. The rock, being a symbol of Christ, had been once smitten, as Christ was to be once offered. The second time it was needful only to speak to the rock, as we have only to ask for blessings in the name of Jesus. By the second smiting of the rock, the significance of this beautiful figure of Christ was destroyed. Moses destroyed the beautiful symbolism that God wanted to teach. That was the seriousness of his sin. And by the way, if we want the Holy Spirit today, Jesus doesn't have to suffer under the judgment of God anymore. That happened once for all. If we want the blessings, all we have to do is ask. Notice Luke 11, verse 13. Luke 11 and verse 13. 
It says, if you then, here Jesus is speaking, if you then, being evil, know how to give good, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And yet there's a church in the world, the Roman Catholic Church. I know that some of you used to be Roman Catholics. That church teaches that every time the Mass is celebrated, Christ is sacrificed again. If God excluded Moses from the promised land for ruining the symbol and giving the impression that Christ would have to suffer under the judgment of God more than once, how does God feel about a teaching of a church that says that Jesus is sacrificed over and over and over again in thousands of places all over planet earth. It's an insult to the Lord. Because the book of Hebrews tells us that when Jesus died, he died once for all. He needs not die anymore. He does not need to suffer under the judgment of God. He already suffered the judgment once and for all for sin and for sinners. Now, what does Pentecost have to do with this? Well, let's take a look at the middle of this page that you have your handout. What did Jesus accomplish by his ministry on earth? That's what we need to know first. First of all, Jesus lived his perfect life in the camp, right? And he lived it for all of us because we can't offer the law perfection. Jesus came and lived the life that the law requires, and he lived it in our place. What else did he accomplish? He offered his life in sacrifice upon the altars. He bore our sins, the sins of the whole world upon himself, so that we wouldn't have to die. He died so that we don't have to die. He lived to offer the law the life that we cannot offer the law. And then Jesus resurrected from the dead at the laver. So he's following the sanctuary, the camp, the altar of sacrifice, the laver. Where would we expect him to go after his resurrection, which is represented by the laver? The next thing that we would expect would be his entering the holy place, right? We would expect after his sacrifice the fire to show approval of the sacrifice that he had offered. Are you understanding me or not? Yes. Now the question is where is that fire manifested showing that God accepted the sacrifice of Jesus Christ? Well we need to study the temple geography. You see in the Hebrew sanctuary, after the altar of sacrifice, you had the labor. And after the labor, you had the ministration of the high priest in the holy place. After Jesus died and resurrected on earth, we would expect him to go where? To begin his ministry in the holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. But you know what most Christians say? Including some Adventists who have left the faith, like Desmond Ford. They say, no, Jesus went directly into the most holy place. That's senseless. What about the holy place? If Jesus lived his perfect life in the camp, if he died at the altar, if he resurrected at the labor, we would expect Jesus next to go into the holy place. And then later to go into the most holy place. So it's foolishness to say that he jumped from the court into the most holy place. Because there is a holy place ministry of Jesus Christ. Now the question is where did Jesus enter? Well, let's read Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 5. This is an interesting detail. Uh, it's describing the heavenly throne room before Jesus arrives. Jesus arrives in chapter 5. Chapter 4, the throne room is being prepared for the arrival of Christ. It says there, And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices, Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Now, where is this event taking place in Revelation 4? In the holy place. How do we know that? Because there are seven lamps of fire, and the seven lamps of fire were in the holy place, right? right. And by the way, the seven lamps of fire represent what? The Holy Spirit. Are there seven Holy Spirits? No. The, the number seven represents their present is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. The totality of the Holy Spirit is present there in the throne room. And then in chapter 5, Jesus arrives. See, in chapter 4, the throne room is prepared. Those who have uh, watched the series on the 24 elders, you know, I have a whole a presentation called The Return of the War Hero, 
where chapter 4, the preparation of the throne room, the cherubim and seraphim are there, the representatives of the worlds are there, uh, you know, the, uh, the Holy Spirit is present there, the Father is sitting on the throne, and everything is in expectancy because in chapter 5, Jesus is returning from the earth victorious in his battle with the devil. And he arrives in chapter 6, chapter 5 and verse 6, and how does he arrive? How does he present himself before his Father? Notice verse 6, And I looked, and behold, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living creatures, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb as though it had been slain. How is Jesus presenting himself? Is he alive when he presents himself? Yes, he died, but now he's coming alive. And he's presenting himself as the lamb as though it had been slain, before the throne where the Father is sitting. And it says, and now notice the nuance here, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven of seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. In chapter 4, the seven spirits are there. But in chapter 5, the seven spirits are what? Sent to the earth. What event is that? That event is the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit is sent to the earth. So in other words, Jesus ascends to the throne room, He presents Himself before His Father, and then uh, the next step is that the Holy Spirit is poured out. The Spirit is sent to the earth. And Ellen White describes it beautifully in the last three pages of Desire of Ages. Wow! If you can read that without goosebumps, I don't know how you can do that, because it is really exciting. And, and it's even going to be more exciting when Jesus comes to take all of his people home. Woo! The heavenly throne room is going to be prepared. By the way, the Father doesn't come at the second coming. He sends forth Jesus. You know, this is, there's this idea that Jesus is coming with the Father. No, no, the Father sits on his throne in heaven. And the throne room will be prepared in heaven. And then Jesus with his angels will come here and Jesus and his angels will call forth the dead, and then we'll take the journey to heaven, and then the heavenly throne room will be prepared to receive the redeemed from all ages. And so Ellen White describes it in a, in a magnificent way. She says that uh, Jesus entered through the gates into the city, and the angels were singing, and they were praising. I mean, thunderous praise. And then Jesus raises his hands, and he says, Shh, silence. So suddenly, all the angels obey, and there's absolute silence. And then Ellen White describes how Jesus enters the presence of his Father. He shows his Father the wounds on his hands, on his brow, his side, his feet. And he says, Father, I need to know if my sacrifice was sufficient to bring all of my people home. I need to know. And the Father says, it is enough. And then the Father embraces His Son. And then the Father says, Let all the angels of God worship Him. And then the angelic hosts sing even at a higher note hymns of praises to the Lamb that was slain. And then the Holy Spirit is poured out and the tongues of fire are seen on earth. The tongues on earth of fire were a signal that the sacrifice of Jesus had been accepted in heaven. Amen. Sacrifice and fire. The same symbolism. God was showing that the striking of the rock was accepted because now the water, the water was coming forth from the rock. Isn't that magnificent symbolism? I mean, how can you understand all of these episodes in the Old Testament without reference to Jesus Christ? In Story of Redemption, page 386, which you have in your material, Ellen White explains the rending of the veil of the temple showed that the Jewish sacrifices and ordinances would no longer be received. Now listen carefully. The great sacrifice had been offered and had been accepted. And the Holy Spirit, which descended on the day of Pentecost, carried the minds of the disciples from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly. Now listen. Where Jesus had entered by His own blood, to shed upon his disciples, not the whole world, folks, to shed upon his disciples the benefits of his atonement. Now what are the benefits of Christ's atonement? The benefits are his perfect life and his death for sin. Those are the benefits of his earthly work. 
and those benefits are available to how many? They're available to everyone. In other words, when Jesus lived his life and died his death, Jesus bought the gift of salvation. He paid for the gift of salvation. Let me ask you, how much does a gift cost you? It costs to the giver, but it's free to the receiver. Now let me ask you, is it possible to refuse a gift that somebody gives you? Of course. Is it possible to refuse the gift that Jesus bought? Oh, you better believe it. You see, it's in the holy place that we receive the gift. When we claim Jesus as our intercessor, when we claim him as our mediator, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And so it's in the service in the holy place where we benefit from what he did on earth. You see, when I come to Jesus repentant, sorry for sin, I say, Lord, I blew it, I'm sorry, I repent, I confess my sin, I'm a miserable sinner, I deserve death, but Jesus, I believe that you lived the life that I should live, you died the death that I should die, I receive you as my Savior and as my Lord. Jesus says, I take my life and my death and I place them to your account and I look upon you as if you had never sinned. You benefit from what he did, personally and individually. Are you following me? For most Christians, you know, everything took place at the cross. Jesus has an important work to perform in the holy place of the sanctuary. Now what happened after the day of Pentecost? Well, the disciples drank the water, and what did they do? <laughs> Woo, they drank the water, and immediately after drinking the water, which means that they received the Holy Spirit, because they had repented and they had confessed their sins the ten days before, and so on, they, they prepared to receive the Holy Spirit. So now they receive the Holy Spirit, and what do they do immediately? They go out and witness. Notice Acts chapter 1, this is on the last page of your material, Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Acts chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. I want you to notice that the expression, you shall, is used twice here. And he said to them, It is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive, there, you shall, notice, you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What did Jesus say? You shall receive what? Power. Power. What for? You know, today you listen to charismatics. They say, oh, the reason for the power is for you to, to have a, a, a good time in church, to roll in the aisles, to laugh in the spirit, and to feel good. You know, it's for your own personal benefit. So you can speak in tongues that not even God can understand. It's all about me, me, me. But the purpose of the Holy Spirit, of receiving the power, is witness. Because it says you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses. Receive and give, is what Jesus is saying. You shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and Samaria, and unto the end of the earth. One final illustration. The Samaritan woman illustrates perfectly what we've been talking about. Jesus goes to uh, Jacob's, Jacob's well. He's sitting there and a woman comes to draw water at noon, which is very, very unusual because water isn't drawn at noon. It's terribly hot in the Holy Land. But this woman had a life that she, uh, that she lived which was uh, morally corrupt, and so she didn't want anybody to see her. So Jesus says, give me water to drink. And she says, how is it that you, a Jew, would speak to a Samaritan? See, this woman progresses in her understanding of Jesus, First of all, Jesus is a Jew, then when Jesus reveals her life to her, she says, I think you're a prophet. By the end of the conversation, she says, I believe you're the Messiah. Amen. And so this woman, uh, you know, Jesus says something very interesting to her in John 4, verses 13 and 14. Notice John 4, 13 and 14. Jesus answered and said to her, whoever drinks of the water, of this water, will thirst again. You drink from this water from Jacob's well, it will you will thirst again. But whoever drinks of the water that I shall give him, it's speaking about Pentecost, listen carefully, that I shall give him will never thirst, but the water that I shall give him will become in him a fountain of water springing up into everlasting life. Are you catching the picture? You come and drink from the fountain and then you become a fountain, is what Jesus is saying. And this woman lived this experience. 
When she accepted Jesus as Messiah, she goes back to Sikar, the city that she lived in. She's not embarrassed now. <laughs> she goes from house to house. She says, I found the Messiah that we've been waiting for. Really? And, you know, she had an excitement in her voice that, that led people to say, wow, we got to hear him. Yeah, I can show you where he's at. And so now she comes with the whole city of Sikar. She drank the water, and now she's giving the water. And then, uh, you know, the disciples come back to Jesus, and they say, Lord, we brought you the food that you told us to go get. And, uh, you know, Jesus said, my food and my drink is to do my Father's will and to finish his work. And the disciples, you know, spiritually blind, they say, well, maybe somebody brought him some food while we were gone. <laughs> and then Jesus says, haven't you heard that there's four months until the harvest? He said, no, no, there's not four months until the harvest. He says, look at the fields. They're already white, ready for the harvest. And you read Desire of Ages, Ellen White says that Jesus was not pointing at fields of barley or fields of wheat. Jesus was pointing at this woman who was coming with the entire city of Sikar to hear the words of Jesus. She drank the water from the fountain, and now she became a fountain of water to others. The greatest sign, brothers and sisters, that we know Jesus is an intense desire to let others know about Jesus. If we are not letting other people know about Jesus, if we don't feel that desire for simply uh, warming the pew, perhaps it's because we haven't known the Lord. I finish by reading this statement from Ellen White, Ministry of Healing 102. She proved herself a more effective missionary than his own disciples. The disciples saw nothing in Samaria to indicate that it was an encouraging field. Their thoughts were fixed upon a great work to be done in the future. Like many Adventists, I say, we're not doing much now, but when the latter rain comes. They did not see that right around them was a harvest to be gathered. But through the woman whom they despised, a whole city full were brought to hear Jesus. She carried the light at once to her countrymen. This woman represents the working of a practical faith in Christ. So is this story of the rock a very significant story? Yes. Is it centered in Jesus Christ? Yes. It most certainly is. If you don't see Christ, you will make no sense out of it. It will be meaningless. But with Christ, it becomes a living passage to teach us important lessons in our spiritual walk with the Lord. Okay, let's take a break. And then uh, the next one we're going to study is a providential election.